So my name is John Powell, and I'm the director of the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society. Um, as a, we had a meeting earlier, we actually are considering a name change. I'll just say that. Maybe something about belonging, I don't know. Um, but today we want to welcome you and thank you for coming. And a special thank to Larry Edelman, uh, who produced uh, a number of really important uh, documentaries dealing with inequity, dealing with health. But this one is called Race, the Power of Illusion. Uh, has anyone seen it? <laughs> All right. It's one of the most uh, viewed documentaries uh, in the history of the country. And more importantly, I think it's one of the most important. It's profound. And so uh, Larry's to be credited, uh, California Newsreel, for producing the document. Um, and uh, Larry approached us, and we approached Victoria about having a joint project to sort of launch the project to have a, um, a website associated with teaching and with interactive uh, lessons. Um, and um, Victoria said yes. We said yes. Larry said yes. There's a lot of yeses in this room. Uh, and so we want to uh, basically acknowledge that and um, we're going to have people coming to the stage uh, in a minute. But another person I want to acknowledge and thanks, I guess, is uh, Michael Omi. Where's Michael? <laughs> so very quick story. Um, I was on my way to the University of Texas at Austin, and I got, a, I got two important calls. One from my daughter saying, you can't go to Texas. I said, why not? It's kind of nice down there. The weather is nice. And, said, uh, and people kept saying to me, you know what? Austin's a nice town. But when you leave Austin, guess what? You're in Texas. <laughs> uh, and you have a granddaughter here in the Bay Area. And I said, you know, I know. And I love my granddaughter. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm trying to launch this institute. And, and um, that's in Texas. And then I got a call from Michael Omi. And Michael said, we're launching this new institute, and the names has already changed a couple of times. So I won't take you through the names. And uh, he said, would you be interested in being the director of it? And I said, well, maybe. And uh, starting an institute is really a lot of work. Uh, and to do it right takes a good seven to ten years. Um, and so I had, I've started a number of them, and I'm trying to get out of the starting new institute business. Uh, <laughs> So when Michael said that, I said, as one condition, I would consider it. He said, what's that? I said, if you would be my deputy, if you would actually do the hard work and I could just sit back and relax. <laughs> <laughs> and Michael said, yes. And for those of you who don't know, Michael and I have been uh, friends forever. Um, and, uh, and, I just wanted, and we came and, and, as I said, the rest is history. Um, I also want to acknowledge special friends, a lot of special friends in the audience. I want to acknowledge you, uh, Marianne Scott, sitting in, in the back, uh, who uh, we became friends because we, uh, when I got here, Berkeley gave me a little, they actually gave me money I thought it was a lot. They said, give you this money to help you buy a house. I said, ooh wee, coming from Ohio, I'm going to be living in a mansion. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, then I got here and uh, I ran into Marianne Scott, who's a realtor. And she started, she said, here, what's your budget? And I told her my budget, she started showing me garages. <laughs> uh, but eventually I did buy a house, uh, thanks to Marianne. And, um, and she's been showing me stuff ever since then. Um, and also I want to thank Rochelle, who's our communication director, who just came back from Greece. Uh, and some of you know, we have a conference every two years called Othering and Belonging. And uh, Marianne is the architect of that conference, and we had a meeting about today. And it's really important, not just as a conference, but as a frame to sort of think about all the work that the clusters do. So without further ado, um, I want to invite the panelists up to the stage. Um, and uh, if there's something else I'm supposed to do, Michelle, tell me. Otherwise, uh, we'll just go forward. Thank you. All right. So I'm Michael Omi of the Department of Ethnic Studies and still an affiliated member of HIFAS, the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society. You know, it was over 15 years ago, 
April 21st, 2003 to be exact, that I had the pleasure of moderating a KQED public forum on, uh, with academics and community leaders uh, discussing race, the power of illusion. And uh, yesterday, I actually found a list of the questions I asked folks uh, during that session. And I asked the esteemed folks on the uh, panel uh, about the ideology of colorblindness, uh, about competing meetings of diversity in different institutional settings, about emerging debates about race and genomics, uh, including in biomedical research. And I asked folks uh, to try to imagine policies that could really help us challenge the persistent racial inequalities in our society. And what's sobering 15 years later is that these are still unresolved and hot button issues and topics. And the continued relevance, certainly, of this series is uh, beyond a dispute. I'm just going to just go over, before we get into our, our conversation, talk to you about the format for this afternoon. Uh, the afternoon consists of actually two panels. Um, this one is the uh, OG, original gangsters <laughs> panel, <laughs> as, as if that wasn't uh, readily uh, evident. <laughs> Uh, here we're going to look back at uh, the development of the series, as well as assessing its uh, continued uh, relevance uh, and impact for different audiences. And the second panel is the Young Bloods panel that <laughs> focuses on emerging scholarship, current trends, and community engagement and social activism. And we want to hear from you as well, uh, but we're going to take Q&A after uh, both the panels. And we'll try to keep those up panels within the manageable time frame as well. And then they'll be followed by a reception and also perhaps some opportunities to look at the uh, new website uh, that will supplement race, the power of an illusion. Uh, so my fellow uh, OGs are Larry Edelman and John Powell. Um, John covered some of this, so, uh, but Larry Edelman really is the creator and the executive producer of the film series. And, He's been a longtime co-director and head of publications also for California Newsreel, which is one of the oldest uh, nonprofit documentary production and distribution centers in the country. Uh, he's done a lot. <coughs> he's also been the creator and executive producer of the multiple award-winning documentary series, Unnatural Causes. Is inequality making us sick? And uh, The Raising of America, which focuses on early childhood and the future of the nation. John Powell, who I'm glad found that parking space, is executive director of the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society and the Robert D. Haas Chancellor's Chair in Equity and Inclusion. Also finds time to, to teach and be a professor in law, African-American studies and ethnic studies. John's most recent book is Racing to Justice, Transforming Our Concepts of Self and Others to Build on Inclusive Society, Build an Inclusive Society. If you haven't read the book, uh, please do so. Um, I've learned so much from John over the years, and particularly his work on equity-based interventions, including concepts such as targeted universalism. I also want to say that John has great taste in soul and R&B music as well, <laughs> much to his credit. Uh, but before uh, we get to our actual conversation, I think Larry has a few acknowledgments he wanted to make Th as well. Well, thank you, Michael. Yes, I would be remiss if I didn't point out among all the people, I won't say them all, who contributed so much to the production of our series in the first place, and as well, of course, as to the relaunch of this new website. Um, so I thought maybe I'd tell a brief story about that rather than just rattle off some names because um, it was clear that a couple of years ago that this original site, which was built in 2003, um, pbs.org slash race would need to be updated. You know, time does change. Um, so what I did is I called, first thing I did was call Gene Chang. Gene uh, is the program manager here at the Academic Innovation Center at Berkeley. But uh, what probably most of you don't know is that Gene was also the associate producer 
of Race to Power of an Illusion, and indeed the producer of the original website um, at pbs.org slash race. And she has a tremendous experience in, in, in digital exhibits, working for the Exploratorium and elsewhere. And Jean says to me, well, why don't you do it here at UC Berkeley? And I said, what? Well, why don't you write a query to John? <laughs> See what he'd say. And, uh, and ask if Hyphus might be interested. And um, meanwhile, <laughs> however, Jean at the same time was talking to Victoria Robinson and also to uh, Rochelle Tenas, from the, your wonderful director of the Media Resource Center, who knows what films everyone here is using, by the way. So. Uh, <laughs> um, and hence the conspiracy to bring it here was born. Um, we then all met with Puanani Forbes. Puanani is here somewhere, or was. Uh, I hope she's still here. Uh, there she is in the back. And uh, who's the Haas? The Haifas. You, you call it Haifas or Haas? We call it both. <laughs> <laughs> I can do no wrong. The Haas chief of staff. Uh, and after talking with John, they gave a go ahead and committed the resources backed by uh, the ACES program, the American Coaches program that Victoria runs in the Media Resource Center. And um, at that point, uh, Rochelle Galway Papatas. Pop, pop, pop. We just don't pop, say it. Pop. <laughs> back, just back in Greece. <laughs> join, join the team. And uh, we were off. But I think I want to just say that Gene is queer, I think all would agree, was absolutely indispensable to getting this new re website launched and uh, rebuilt. From concept, worked on it from conceptualization to implementation. And in fact, I was still getting, she even helped plan this event, I was still getting emails from her this morning. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Victoria and Giselle's hard work and brilliance were also key to making it all real. So I, I just want, as Jean herself would be first to testify, so I just want to make that clear. Um, Jean, Victoria, Giselle, and, and Rochelle uh, worked with Lu Lucas Gilkey and Lulu Matute, Evan Bissell, and Conrad Fulbrook to help conceptualize the site's design. And then Mark Abzai, also at HIFAS, who's uh, running this event at the moment, the logistics on it, joined the team and worked incredibly hard uh, along with um, the uh, web design team, Black Antelope, to bring the ship to shore. So helped by Doug Parada and uh, Gibran Huerta. So I, I want to give everybody here yeah. a round of applause, really. Because the result, because the result, as you'll see, is a, just a terrific new site. It only, it only has new video clips that are up, uh, videos by faculty here test, look, talking about what clips they use and how they use it in class and to what end. It has backgrounders, quizzes, and it's built in a way in which it'll be expandable so that other people can bring up, so you can bring in new and updated material to make the site continue to be a living site um, now and in the future. But I'm not done. Because <laughs> while I'm here, I really need to do, I would be remiss, please bear with me, um, if I didn't just thank a few more people. Um, because rarely in the production of this series, have I ever been involved in a, in a sh work where so many contributed so much so generously, and that's what made it all possible. And I, I, am, I and all of us should be deeply, deeply in their debt. Our advisors, of course, um, led by Troy Duster, who unfortunately can't be here today. Uh, Troy was just wonderful. Um, and was the first, and, and he was the first of a group of world-class scholars, uh, such as Richard Gluenton, uh, Evelyn Hammonds, Audrey Smedley, Alan Goodman, um, and our moderator, Michael Omi, uh, who steered us right, gave us stories and resources, uh, critiqued r scripts and rough cuts, and in many occasions, more than once, kept our feet from entering our mouth. Um, and Michael's book, Racial Formation in the United States, along with Howie, uh, Howie Winant, was, um, was one of our core texts. We used it. I refer to it oftenly, off, often, and their re, your revised third edition, Why Do We Revise, was published just a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So I urge people to check it out. I don't know if I talked to you then or later, but at some point we talked, and, you, 
and John's work was absolutely indispensable in his participation in the series, as well as in our future projects as well. So that was a great fortuitous meeting. Um, and my colleagues at California Newsreel, who provided the support <coughs> to get this going, uh, my co-director at the time, Cornelius Moore, who's over here, uh, Steve Guy, who's in the audience, I want to thank you too. Um, and then the, I want to say just a little bit about the funders who decided to take a flyer on such a crazy idea. I mean, it sounded good on paper, but how are you going to do this on film, for God's sakes, right? Um, first, the independent television service, the ITVS, led by the late Jim Yee, who was indispensable, not just with money, but with counsel, and also with dealing with PBS. Um, enough said. Um, the Oakland-based Akinati Fund, uh, brand new at the time, uh, came in with finishing funds, and Quinn Delaney will be here, said she'd be here later. Um, and, uh, but most of all, um, I want to thank our major funder, the Ford Foundation. Uh, in, and I am so happy that their founding director of their media, arts, and cultures program, someone you know from here at Berkeley, uh, to know well here from her work here over the years, um, Professor Margaret Wilkerson. I want to, seriously. Yeah. Um, professor, professor of uh, di African dias Diaspora Studies as well as uh, Drama, Theater, and Literature, or uh, Performance Studies, I guess is what we call it now. Um, because without your faith and trust, when we walked in and discussed this film for the first time, and, and using your wonderful sharp elbows there at Ford Foundation, this, this film just wouldn't got to get done. And not only that, more, she gave the encouragement to go all the way. Don't do a halfway job. Really, if you're going to do it, just, you know, damn the torpedoes, whatever. Um, go all the way, at first at least, and then pull back. <laughs> so I, wa I want to thank you because, um, you know, and, and I also want to say that you have a uh, biography of Lorraine Hansberry that's coming out. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> You know. And she was also one of then our episode producers, and then I'm done. Uh, Christine Herbie Summers, Lou Smith, and Tracy's, Tracy Strain um, were the led our wonderful production teams. And Tracy's film um, on Lorraine Hansberry, is, which Dr. Wilkerson was an advisor and on camera talent, is about to be rebroadcast on Friday on American Masters on KQED. So check that out if you haven't. Um, finally, those who breathed life into the series, those who really gave it life are those who used it. Um, without people who, um, you know, the, the, the educators, the community leaders, the civic officials who integrated it into their own work, it would simply be a flickering image on the screen. That's where, you know, that's, that's where it happens. It happens, you're the folks who've used this film who make it happen. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Larry. Thank you. Yeah, thank you a lot. Yeah, I'm glad you had the opportunity to really like acknowledge all the folks who uh, made the series happen. But so, um, so are we finished now? Yeah, you've we've used up your time. time, but but let's do a brief, brief backstory. Uh, it's the dawn of the 21st century. There's a lot going on in the country. What was the kind of initial motivation or inspiration to take on this series? What were you oh, trying to do? Wow, well, that's a long time ago. Um, there were two 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 things. One internal at Newsreel. You know, we, Newsreel is a distributor of films, not just a producer. So we could see, and we we're in touch with people who use them, we sort of got a sense of what was not just out there, but what wasn't out there, and how the films were used since we talked to people every day. And we could see conversations on race and racism, in many cases, going right past each other. Um, and, and we realized for all the discussion and interest in race that nobody ever really stepped back to ask this question, like, what is this idea of race anyway? You know, and if you t even today, if you ask 10 people what is race, you're likely to get 10 different answers. Um, at the same time, the, at that time, we had, of course, there was Ward Connolly. Remember Ward Connolly? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Leading the charge against affirmative action with his successful 2000 Proposition 209, the consequences, the results of which we're still dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, he arguing that we live in a post-racial world, right? We make, as indicated before, are talking about the importance of colorblindness. 
You know, why are we wickeding ra race, racial preferences, he would ask slyly. You know, the civil rights movement was 30 years ago. Um, it was, as uh, Eduardo Bonilla Silva wrote in a seminal article which would turn into a great book, an era of racism without racist. Meantime, there was a lot of diversity training going on, if you remember, those of you can remember. Um, too much of which, I think, in my estimation, was encouraging participants to respect each other's differences. Well, that was good as far as it one goes, but what that tended to do too often was take the asym asymmetry of racism and sort of neuter it by reducing racism to a symmetry of races. I mean, we all have a race, right? Um, so, and, and at the same time, rendered the structures, the structures of, that produce and reproduce racism invisible. And finally, at the same time, it, however, on the other hand, it was becoming trendy to begin to talk about race as being socially constructed. Um, but that acknowledgement in too many circles seemed to end the discussion rather than to begin it. Like, how is it constructed? How is it made? How was it, how did it change over the years? And people then in fact would say, okay, race is socially constructed, and then go back and talk about race and races as they always did. Like, there's three races, or maybe five, or perhaps it's 55. But in any way, there was this assumption of, of great difference. Um, so as a result, I began to read and talk to other people and began the great, as speaking to the scholars we brought on board, got the best education money can't buy. I mean, personal seminars, from, it was just great. But what I realized, and I think when I realizing about the things like the recent origins, not the ancient origins of, of the idea of race, Realizing the way in which it's so deeply embedded in our history, the way realizing how the, ge the, the genetics of human variation, while there are geographic patterns, cannot be mapped on to what we call races. Um, learning, of course, the way in which um, government policies and practices, particularly through redlining, created, in fact, the, you know, the segregated white suburbs and the advantages which I, was able and my family took advantage of. Um, but the important thing here, what I want to say is, I didn't know any of this. This whole, I was like flabbergasted. I said, how come I don't know this stuff? Why isn't this like, I mean, it makes so much sense. I mean, now I'm not college educated, but I was involved in the civil rights and movement struggles since I was in high school. And I'm relatively well read, and yet I didn't know about this. And there were no films on it, so that's what really inspired that work. Great. John, what got you, uh, what was intriguing to you about this project and about its approach to looking at questions around race? Well, um, you know, the, I think race is a crucible to actually understanding America. And, um, um, and sometimes we think about race or issues of race or concern about race as an issue for people of color without understanding the role of whiteness as an ideology. Um, and as Larry said, I think also this, the confusion around race is consequential. It's not simply that people have different ideas about race. Uh, you may have often heard me say that um, race and racism, which are two different things, and racialization was the third thing, uh, those things are not rocket science. They're harder than rocket science. <laughs> Uh, and like gravity, I feel like all of us have a weight. and We talk about you know, how much you weigh. Usually we cheat. We usually knock down a few pounds. Uh, <laughs> the scale is wrong. Uh, but by some accounts, they say, uh, astrophysicists say, there are only about 12 people in the world that really understand gravity. It's consequential. Without gravity, no Earth. Without gravity, no people. But it's the, the complexity of it is profound. Um, and so to me, one of the things about this project is it started to peel away some of the complexity. And as Larry say that, t you know, we're sort of coming to, we're coming into our own, at least through the academy and through research to say that racially is so race is socially constructed. But that actually doesn't tell us very much. In fact, a lot of people use that concept to actually run away from race. Mm -hmm. So you get a thing like, since race is not real, why are we spending so much time, time with it? Uh, and they miss the sort of critical point that 
not only is race socially constructed, but the question is how is it constructed, what work is it doing, and why? Uh, and the why is very important because when you think of the, about the why, you realize that the elites are using race to actually structure the economy, to structure our political system. So when we're really talking about race, we're not talking about, you know, I got stopped by police. Yes, that's part of it. But it's like the whole construction of our society. Um, Paul Krugman, uh, in one of his books, uh, The Consciousness of, uh, of a Liberal, he, he writes, and this is at the time that Obama's coming on the scene, so he writes, he's a Nobel economist, most of you probably read him in the New York Times, and he says, you can't understand the uh, economics in the United States and economic structure without understanding race. And on the left, we actually have the people who are concerned about race, usually people of color, and the people who are concerned about class and economy, usually progressive whites, and they fight, they fight each other. Which one is more important? How do they are interrelated? And Krugman is saying, you know what, you can't get it. He almost gets it right because at the very end of the book he said, that was true up until now. Because now we're entering into this post-racial society where race is no longer going to be important. Oops. Uh, so part of it is, 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 again, to me, the understanding of race, the sort of uh, unearthing that, which I think race the power of illusion is one of the most profound expressions of that, gives us an insight into the entire society. Not just about black people, not even just about white people, but about our structures, about our political systems, about our economic systems. Uh, and if, if we really understand it, it also hints at a way to go forward. So I often say, one, race is a process. Race is a, a verb. It's not a thing. It's a verb. It's a process. What are we doing? How are we doing it? And two, that it's actually changing from, in front of our very eyes. The way we, and it gives us insight into not just race, but into identity, period. So one of the things I oftentimes say as well is that it's not simply that race is socially constructed, which it is, but so is gender. So is the self. And no one would say, well, since the self is socially constructed, it's not real. <laughs> Let's not have a self. Uh, and so race is a, maybe a, a scientific fiction, but it's a social fact with serious consequences. Um, and again, I think Race, the Power of Illusion, the film, began to do that. And the last thing I'll say is when I showed the film to friends, and including my father, and those of you who know me know I always talk about my father and my mother. My mother passed away. The sharecroppers, my dad is 98, uh, creeping up on 100. Uh, and he's lived most of the, many of the things in the movie you know, in terms of Jim Crow, in terms of uh, literally being taken off of sharecropper land to put sandbags for rising waters to save white land. Now think about that, taking black people to risk their lives to save white land. That's part of his life, uh, to be moved to the segregated, from the segregated south to the segregated north, to buy a house that I grew up in that he had to buy on a land contract because he couldn't get money to sell that house recently, a house that he raised nine kids in that was immaculate to the time he left, and he sold it recently for $5,000 in Detroit. So this, you know, these are real things. You can, they had real meat to these bones. Mm -hmm. And when my dad saw the film, he cried. He said, I had lived that, but I hadn't put the whole story together. These were incidents. I hadn't realized there was a through line so again, so when, like many people, when you think about race, you think about being black or being whatever, uh, but not about where he lives, not about where his kids go to schools, not about the fact that my great-grandmother died because she couldn't get into the hospital because of the way we organized race. Uh, so the film helps us see all that. Uh, so to me, uh, the only regret I would have in terms of the film is that, you know, there's how, I mean, how many have you seen the movie Fast and Furious? There's Fast and Furious 1, there's Fast and Furious 2, there's Fast and Furious 3. I th I literally, I think we're up to 8 now, you know? So we should have Race and Power Illusion 1, 2, 3, 4. <laughs> so I know Larry wants to kick back and, and sort of enjoy life, but we need, a, a, uh, we need not only the website, we need the next version of Race the Power of Illusion.
Yeah. You know, the, the film series is, is organized along three broad, what do you call it, rubrics, frames, lenses. I don't know if you could, either of you maybe, talk about why that, the decision to organize the series in that form and whether or not that form still has continued relevance today. And why don't you tell them what the three okay. rubrics are? Yeah, he should explain that. <laughs> well, in For essence, those of you who haven't seen it. In essence, the, the three th episodes, each an hour, is the hi history of the idea, the, um, the science of human variation, and of course, if race doesn't, is not biologically innate, where is it lived? Where is it produced and reproduced? And that is the way in which how it manifests itself today and by disproportionately channeling power, status, and wealth to folks who look like me, white folks. You know, you mentioned your father. My story, my family is the flip side of that. Mm -hmm. You see, I grew up, we, we, my father in the GI Bill was able to get a house in a, one of those post-war suburbs in a place called Merrick, Long Island on the South Shore. And as a result, when that house appreciated in value, when my father was able to, uh, when he retired and sold that place in 1990, the house that he had bought for, for I think, nineteen or $20,000 many years ago, he sold for $300,000, so we're talking 1990. So that's an appreciation of value of how many times? From 20,000 to th our math whizzes here, um, to $300,000. And with that money, he was able to help three kids go to college, well, one dropped out. Um, <laughs> help, helped helped his, his kids put down payments to their homes. That's how we got our place, help with the down payment. Um, whereas, you know, and so, but I didn't know this story, and nor did anyone else, all those white kids who grew up in that white suburb didn't know that story. And that white suburb was adjacent to a town that is in this show called Roosevelt, which became a black suburb, if you remember. And not only that, we're th only three miles from, from Levittown. Mm -hmm. So in a certain, there was a, let's just say there was a, sort of a personal interest in trying to sell this story, tell that that particular story once I learned it. But I didn't know it. And this is what was blowing my, how could I not, right? Was I living with blinders? We all were, as white folks. You know, we just didn't get this stuff. The history of the idea, that was one, that, let me, and I'll stop at that one, um, is, was also, you know, I, I like to, t to quote Mark Twain's old adage that it's not what you don't know that hurts, it's what you think you know that ain't so. And our, <laughs> president um, proves that every day. Uh, but it also has to do with race. For example, I really thought that race was, racism, race and racism was always part of Western culture. Now, there was people saw differences, but the idea of race, the idea of this innate biological difference really began, if you follow the work of, say, uh, Barbara Fields and Edmund Morgan and others, not with slavery, actually, but with democracy. You know, up until then, slavery had been an unquestioned natural fact of life. Nobody questioned it. There were hierarchies. You know, there was uh, the, the peasant and the lord, you know, the, the lord and the king, the king to the king of kings. There were these natural hierarchies, and slavery was part of that deal. And by an accident of history, which, you know, Africans became slaves here in the United States, and then, however, and, and live side by side with indentured servants from, from England. And then, however, in early, early colonial North America. But then we have Jefferson and those self-evident truths that all men are created equal. And as Fields and others points out, for the first time you have this radical affirmation of freedom and equality. And as a result, and this is believed, this is the walking stuff of the people who are making the building, making that our revolutionary war. As a result, for the first time, slavery needs a radical mm -hmm. defense. It never needed a defense before. Of course, the slaves protested, but among the rest of the folks. So how is it in a na the nation, how is a nation that professed a profound belief in equality, how could they 
the only way they could justify slavery or rationalize slavery was say there's something different about those people. They don't have the capacity for freedom. And in that sense, the began of the, you see the beginnings of this notion of race as an innate biological difference, which based, but, it, but racism, she argued, gives birth to this idea of race. Not the, it's not the obverse. It's not that we think of people as different. And then it's the fact that we have people who are, in a, who are oppressed, a group of people who are oppressed, and that oppression then needs to be justified or rationalized. Now, it's a little more complicated than that, but it's a simple thing. And then that, that idea of race becomes a template. It becomes an all-purpose justifier, right, for the Indian removal and genocide, for the Mexican-American War. You look at the Chinese Exclusion Act. You go through the, um, the war in the occupation of the Philippines. Um, even the Eastern and Southern European immigrants is still used. To that, and it was just, again, all this stuff was just so mind-boggling for me. That demanded a film of its own. So that's how we sort of, each of these subjects, the, the history, and, we, and that's why we called it, by the way, race, I, this, that episode, the story we tell. Because race is a story to rational, in many ways, to rationalize those inequalities. John, what do you think about those, uh, those well, let's, let's go different on the three broad frames. You know, in many respects, some of the things which the film touches upon, um, many of the kinds of structural inequalities have only deepened over the last 15 years about patterns of residential segregation, uh, health disparities, incredible wealth inequality, and of course, you know, mass incarceration as well. Uh, are, there, are there trends or issues we've missed over this last 15 years in thinking about the film? Well, you know, the world, hopefully we keep learning. You know, part of being alive is to learn. And so the way, and, and race is not one thing, it's many things. It's, I, I sometimes compare it to cancer Cancer is not one disease, it's many diseases, it's come, kept, keep mutating. So the way we did race as a practice uh, 100 years ago is not how we do race today. We couldn't have done race like we did it 50 years ago and had President Obama elected. So the way we do race keeps changing. And in that change, we have an opportunity to learn new things. So for example, uh, 50 years ago, we didn't talk about implicit bias. Uh, the assumption was, that we are completely, our minds are completely transparent. We know what we want and think, and we know who we are. And now the science is coming out uh, around the mind science, and particularly implicit bias says, no, that's not true. That the unconscious mind is actually the largest part of the mind. It's not under our control. And here's one of the interesting things in terms of that lesson, is that people then think of race and racism as prejudice, as activity between two people which is not accurate. Uh, people at one point, and I oftentimes say this, I'm old enough to have watched part of the racial migration in my own lifetime. So I was born as a colored boy. No one asked me, right? It's like, I mean, literally, if you go back to old birth certificates, you'll see C for color. At some point, those will change from color to Negro. Now, it's not just a change in nomen nomenclature, it's also a change in social location. Uh, and it's not just a social location of Negroes, it's a social location of whites and other people as well. And then the first public figure as a black man who was black was Malcolm X. And blackness was a defiant space. It was a revolutionary space, whereas the Negro was like an accommodating space. And so, and now we're sort of like African-American. And then we have African Americans, but then what about all the people from Nigeria who are Africans but not really Americans? So do we need a new nomenclature? And the answer is yes, we're sort of constantly evolving. And I think uh, from my perspective, one of the things that we're slipping back into as a progressive movement is the kind of racial essentialism uh, that we're not paying enough attention to. And I'll give you a concrete example. Uh, I just was at a big meeting of the ACLU, about 1,500 people, and people are arguing about, you know, should white people just talk to white people? Should black people just talk to black people? Should Latin, you know, it's like each group go fix, fix it. First of all, race as a process is radically <coughs> relational. It doesn't make sense in a deep way to say, with, without 
black people, there are no white people. Without white people, there are no black people. So it's deeply relational. We haven't actually delved into that in a real way. Uh, the reason we had anti-miscegenation laws uh, is because people were miscegenating. <laughs> right? So someone says, hell, stop that. Stop that. <laughs> you know? and, and the good news is, folks, we're miscegenating now. Uh, so I'll give you a concrete example. So at Linux, Kemp, there's big meetings, smart people, they sell you, and they're saying, we each belong to our own groups, and we shouldn't be, you know, whatever. And I do this, right? I say, the concept of interfamilies, that is, if someone is in your family of a different race or ethnicity, it's called an interfamily. I hate the term. We come, need to come up with a different term. Uh, so just as an experiment, is someone in your family, in your intimate relationship, of a different race or ethnicity, raise your hand. Look around the room. Everybody. So when someone says, this is one of the things we haven't learned, Michael. When someone says, well, you know what? Whites can't be in the racial justice movement except as allies because they are twice removed or they're the problem. Okay, that makes sense, right? Except what if I'm white with a black child? What if I'm Latino with an Asian child? What if I'm Asian with, you know, so now my fight for racial justice it's not simply about an ally, it's about my family. It's interesting, we have not integrated that into our movement. We actually, and the number of people who are in interfamilies by some accounts is approaching 90 million people. Where are they in this movement? Where is that discourse in the movement? It's absent. It's amazing that it's absent. Uh, and we have a time to sort of rethink this. And Denise, who uh, took over from Teku, who took over from Michael, uh, is, is, is now pushing us to say 19, 20, 2019, the 400th anniversary of slavery in the U.S. What does that mean? How has slavery migrated? How is it still with us? So there's still a lot we haven't learned, but we are learning. We're learning about the relationship between the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. We're learning the relationship between structures and, and, and mind. We're learning the relationship between the process of othering racially and the process of othering in terms of religion. We're learning the relationship between othering race and authoritarianism. Uh, and yet, we have, as, Michael, as uh, Larry said, this sort of deep ignorance that we keep advancing. And so, new case on affirmative action. And the argument is always that affirmative action is bad because there are a group of people, mainly whites, but now Asians too, who really worked hard to get whatever they got. And they deserve it. And as I said some years ago, when we, we make that argument on merit, we assume that white people, as Hofchild talks about in Strangers in, the, in Their Own Land, which is an interesting title, and I think the book is worth a read. But I also say, how did, they, how did the land get to be their land? <laughs> strangers in their own land. They could say, strangers in somebody else's land. <laughs> uh, and so there's an assumption still of deep entitlement for whiteness with an absence of the elites. When Larry's talking about the creation of whiteness, the elites didn't consider themselves white. Whiteness is the middle stratum. We actually haven't incorporated that into our learning as well either. And we need to fight more than just interracial stuff. We need to fight the elites and the way the elites use race, use the other, to actually construct society. The last thing I say on this is that Last two things. <laughs> okay, last three. No, last two things. <laughs> race is changing. The way we do race today is not the way people will do it 10 years from now. The way I did race, have been doing race in my life, is not the way my granddaughter will do race. Race is changing. And not just the race of black people, white people. Race is changing for all of us. That's actually one of the great anxieties in the world. And it's being used. Will we create a new inclusive we or not? And we have to get away from racial essentialism, even in the progressive community. And we have to help people who categorize themselves as white and think they earn whatever they got to realize that it's not that they earned what they got. It's not saying they didn't work hard. It's not saying whatever. But they just happen to be the white person at the white place at the white time. <laughs> Good. Make a good book title. <laughs> <laughs>
I want to try to be mindful of the time here, uh, particularly for the second panel. Larry, I'm going to give you the uh, last opportunity here um, to say something about what's been interesting or surprising to you about the reception to race, the power of an illusion, and well, its enduring impact. Most obviously, I think that it's still being used 15 yeah. years after its, its, um, its release. And I, I suppose on the one hand, that's a, a tribute to us and the job we did. On the other hand, I think it's really sad. It's sad that, number one, that nothing else has apparently come along to do this work better um, mm -hmm. on film. And number two, as John alluded to before, we still, or maybe it was you, we still need it. We're still fighting many of these same battles. And even though the terms have changed, it is just, you know, if anything, I think, you know, the, 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 it's, um, battle lines are drawn even stronger. So that's one mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. What I was surprised about, um, we knew the film, would, because the film was so filled with uh, these aha moments for folks, uh, we knew the film would be used widely. We were surprised by how well it was received by the mainstream media. Hmm. Um, it got, despite the fact that it came out just in the aftermath of the Iraq War, um, is that still going on? <laughs> um, the invasion of Iraq, I should say, the yeah. initial invasion, the um, second. Uh, it was widely reviewed, um, editorials, columnists, on the radio. Uh, it, was up, it was panned by the New York Times, Alessandra Stanley thought it was uh, boring and, and didn't say anything new. Uh, but uh, the Washington Post did three articles on it, did three pieces. Um, the Times actually then went back and did an in-depth feature on, on Levittown on, on how, and the post-war, how the creation of the post-war segregated suburbs mm. using the characters mm. in the film. Um, and then most of all, then it was used in a lot of academic was shown in a lot of academic conferences, which was critical, thanks to the work of our outreach director at the time, Timothy Howard, and our publicist, um, the, um, Gwen McKinney. So for example, Troy Duster was at the time was um, the president of the American Sociological Association, did a big event at the mm -hmm. ASA in Atlanta, um, in which the film was screened and debated. And most of all, thanks to the, with the discussion guide and the tools that we had put up on the website, people were able to easily bring it into their work in both formal and non-formal education. And so how widely it was used, I, I mean, we knew it would be used, but the fact that it became, the fact that my nephew said to me one day many years ago, if I have to see your film one more time, <laughs> you know, that, that surprised me. That's great, thank you. Well, listen, I'd like to thank my uh, fellow OGs here. and. Um, We'll do this again in 15 years. <laughs> but uh, we'll transition now to the second panel. Thank you. Thanks so much. So I'm Victoria Robinson. I have the great uh, privilege of being the director for the American Culture Center. But I just want to point out, is Ron here? Ron Choi? Here's Ron. Ron actually made the AC Center what it is. He created the community that it depends on and nurtures. And um, Ron Choi was the co-conspirator thought partner with Troy in putting the American Cultures program together. So thanks for all that you've done and that I've inherited, Ron. Um, so the AC Center helps to govern the American Cultures curriculum. How many people in here have taken an AC course? So the rest of you who haven't and need to, come and see me afterwards. But the AC requirement is the only campus graduation requirement. And as Ron would often say, could you imagine a group of UC Berkeley faculty actually deciding on anything, <laughs> right? One thing and agreeing on it. Um, and what would be the thing that they would agree on that would be so important that the one campus graduation requirement that you couldn't, this was it. This was your singular Berkeley experience. You couldn't get away with graduating without it. What would be the question? And it would be race. And the American culture's requirement um, is hooked into the ways in which race is singular and central to the American experience and how its comparativity, its relationship to our social structures, to its ongoing dynamism, how that's always present in the way in which we experience America. So for those of you who don't know me, because you're like, what the hell is this white British woman up there doing as director of the AC Center? I always say, revenge. 
So anyway, enough jokes. That's how we, um, we thought we'd roll today. Uh, I want to be, I'm just really grateful that we have these, these three wonderful people up, up here with us and so many others in the audience. But first of all, let me say that this uh, new website that accompanies the film, the great film, is trying to do the next layer and level of work that's been named on the stage already. Is that, no pun intended, the fundamental DNA of Race, the Power of an Illusion is still there and intact. And what we did with a group of thought partners across campus is imagine its 21st century experience. What would it look like to take this film into the next generation of its life and engage the ways in which we as public, as community, as academics are thinking about the relationship of the film today? So I invite you to have a look at what that, that looks like. We've reframed and founded some of the ways in which we think about the questions in the film. We've created questions around new structures of the film. And we've really depended upon the expertise of the UC Berkeley community to imagine how we think and teach about the subject framework today. So I want to thank all the Berkeley faculty who've already been interviewed. As you look and experience the website outside on some of the laptops, you'll be able to see um, these Berkeley experts thinking about their own work. And if we've not approached you yet, you are so not off the hook. <laughs> Just you wait for that email and then we'll get you on camera too. So um, what I have here is uh, three colleagues from across the campus who I think are going to be able to really engage us in these new dimensions of the film and the relativity of, of the film to their work today. Dr. Darlene Francis from the School of Public Health and Neuroscience. Um, the big AC course that she used to teach in integrative biology takes its name from one of the films that is inspired by Race, the Power of an Illusion. And the course was called Unnatural Causes is Inequality Making Us Sick. Sound familiar? Yeah. One of the most popular AC courses in the biosciences here at, at Berkeley. Dr. Jason Corbin in the School of Public Health and City and Regional Planning. Can you see how hard we make our faculty work that they have to have multiple appointments? <laughs> We're bad models. Of bad models. <laughs> <laughs> Jason teaches, again, one of these big AC courses um, of which the legacy of Bill Satariano is written into that course. Bill also used to use um, a natural causes in the framing of this big introduction to community health. 350 students at the last count, right, Jason? And then Lula Matute, who, um, there's a bit of nepotism going on here because Lulu and I are great friends and she's a student of mine. Lulu is a fantastic organizer, scholar, is joining a caravan from Honduras to Mexico tomorrow. The work that she's presented on this campus through the Haas Scholars Program problematizes the very categories of thinking that is being framed by the immigration debate too, which of course are anchored into our understandings of race and racial others. So can you please um, welcome our three colleagues to the stage. Okay, Ooh, I've lost my mic. Michael, you made this look too easy. <laughs> he it's did. not easy. He did. All right, Darlene, let's, let's, let's go from left to right, or okay. your right to my left. Um, so since the film was created 15 years ago, it's at the dawn of a field called epigenetics. Now, epigenetics is something that um, is very central to the work that you do. Can you tell us where that field is now since the launch of this film, and how central is the connection of race and epigenetics? So I feel like I almost want to connect something that um, Larry and John said, talking about how we operationalize and define and where a lot of um, the current field comes from, because we're talking about epigenetics, but I think we have to talk about the construct of genetics and where that comes from. And so in my work, um, I, we were talking about the sort of the massive platforms now where you can go and genotype yourselves and sort of have your ethnic heritage reported back to you and all of those things. Um, and I forgot that I had done that ages ago for myself, and so I just went to see my most recent uh, 23andMe profile. And I'm curious how many people in the room have um, used any of those platforms to look at your, just raise your hands high. So quite a few people. Um, and and it's, it's interesting, and sort of as a scientist and as a neurobiologist, for me it was even, it was, it was really not about the science for me, it was actually quite personal when I did that. Um, so I am a neurobiologist. I started my, my research and my training as an undergraduate, as a gen somebody who was really interested in genetics. Um, 
And if I ask you, we're talking so much about race and sort of Victoria standing up there and declaring, you know, her identity. So if I had to ask the room to categorize me in any of those three, five, or seven races, where would you, where would you lead with? Mixture. Huh? <coughs> Mixture. Mixture? Anybody? Yeah. What? Yep. <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> I'll, I'll ask you to define which, which, okay, of, Yep. It's because I know what I am. Yep. So we are yep. Yep. We're all mutts. Yep. Anybody else? That's not a category, though, <laughs> right? So that's not a category. Uh, so I've been in the U.S. I'm Canadian. If you hear me say about, uh, you'll know that I'm Canadian. Uh, and I came to the U.S. at age 30, and I had a Ph.D. in neurobiology, and I was doc. I was introduced everywhere as doctor, doctor, doctor. Um, and I, and I was doing my HR paperwork and I was doing research training at Emory University in Atlanta. And the HR people were really angry at me because I refused to check any of those boxes. I'd never been asked to identify my race ever. For 30 years, it was just me. Uh, and uh, I made a lot of people happy because they got to, they got to, to, to get, you know, take credit for all of this measure. Um, so my father is black and uh, black from Nova Scotia, and there's a really interesting history about the black population in Nova Scotia, which is related to the slave trade. Um, so I, I printed up my 23andMe really to sort of for entertainment purposes. So that's how I use this platform, for purely entertainment purposes. Um, and then my mother is First Nations Micmac, and the world treats me like a white woman. And my experience is going through the world and my little sister and I look like all of the women in my mother's family. And my voice quivers when I tell this story because it's life. Um, and my sister looks like all of the women in my father's family. And we've had such different trajectories with similar opportunities, similar uh, home life. Uh, I'm a tenured Berkeley professor in, in the States. My sister was a, uh, in the Canadian military. She was a single mother, you know, got shot at. Um, and I would argue uh, and, and use the, you know, the single um, data set for my family that my mom had five kids, same parents, um, that if you stratified us by skin color, you'd be right and made any predictions, you would be right. Whether we're talking about health, whether we're talking about wealth, whether we're talking about uh, opportunities, whether we're in, in any category, you would be right. So think about that. And I go through the world um, uh, being treated you know, dramatically differently from my siblings. So uh, when I was finishing high school in the late 80s and early 90s, I studied genetics because we were told, and I was told, that genes are the answer. All of the variability that we experience in the world is due to genetics. And so if I'm going to understand why I'm a white kid and a black, and my siblings identify as black, uh, and I don't identify as anything, right? So I can tell you how the world treats me. Uh, and when it matters, you know, the narratives that I tell for, for purposes. But um, uh, I study genetics because that's where all the answers were going to be. And the, the longer I spent uh, uh, going deeper and deeper and more reduced and more cellular and more molecular, the further away I got from what I knew to be my experience and how that was represented. And so the research that I do is really look, is debunking a lot of this gene-centric, again, we're talking about race. Uh, I, would, I would extend that and, and say we need to talk about our genetic constructs and, and the role of genes, uh, because that really is underlying these platforms and the presumption that these genetic differences are creating or dictating our reality. And so my research is really demonstrating um, controlling for all of the, the usual critiques and, and variables that our lived experiences are really the most powerful predictors of outcomes that most of us care or many of us care about um, and using that in different platforms and so uh, I forget how I started this oh so I, I, so I was going to share my 23 and me <laughs> darling so, as you do that can you yeah. say but w what there is some fuel going on you just saw how many people in the room actually said they'd done that genetic testing. Right. So are, yeah. what kind of misconceptions are being fueled by so that let me, testing? So let me tell you, for folks who've done it, do you understand how they interpret, how they generate that data to feed back to you? So how, how that happens? So it's really easy and inexpensive now to genotype. So in my research program, every time we would get access to different genes, we would genotype us, ourselves in the lab for fun. And I'm interested in stress and social behavior, I, truly for fun. Um, <laughs> And it was, and, you know, it was expensive. And now that it's so affordable, so it, so genotyping is the easy part, 
right? The science sort of that extracting, taking blood or taking saliva actually for these tests is super easy. Now you can do it for 200 bucks or 100 bucks. So that's the easy part. Um, and then you send it off and then you get data back. And, and so few people know what happens between when you spit in that saliva tube and when the data comes back. And so uh, I printed this up, actually, I just went to their website thinking about what we're going to talk about. Um, and I actually didn't know what the sample sizes were. So the genotyping is done in the lab, super easy, extract your, uh, your DNA and sequence it. And then to get your uh, categorization back about your ethnic heritage or racial heritage, it's really um, statistical programming and modeling. And I would argue, and, and I, for certain, that folks who are engaged uh, in issues of race and ethnicity and those topics are not at the table framing these discussions. Uh, and I can promise you that I am not represented in this, in this right? So uh, no indigenous populations from North America or any of the Americas are captured in any of the platforms that are currently genotyping. So there's that. So, and think about how many billion people are on this planet and the total sample size for these reference populations that they're feeding back to all of us is 11,000 people. So in this room, we captured more diversity than, than that in this room. So how on earth, so I use it for entertainment purposes and for teaching purposes. Um, and so, you know, the, the most recent example playing out in popular media with um, Elizabeth Warren and mm -hmm. Donald Trump, not my president, <laughs> um, so not my president. Um, right, the arbitrary, the ridiculousness of that. And there are no indigenous people who, are, who have contributed to any of these populations. So my questions are, who identifies the populations? Who defines what the populations are? Um, what informs those decisions? And because these are commercially available platforms, I promise you that what's overrepresented are rich white people, right? <laughs> uh, and what's not represented are uh, people who can't afford to do this. And, and certainly not any of us who are um, anything, <laughs> anything in between. Mm. Well, because as you, as you named it, this is exciting and um, entertaining information. We'll come back to you in a second, yeah. if that's okay, yeah. So Jason, uh, so Jason, you famously wrote a book called Street Science. And I'm really interested in asking you kind of a couple of questions. So one is that, um, as we already heard from John and Larry and Michael, that the ways in which race was used to create the tools of redlining, how property and space and opportunity and wealth are so interwoven, and how in the work that you do with communities around health equity work, how are you seeing those very exclusions then create the basis for new exclusions? And what does that look like and how you're thinking about your work? But secondly, and I have, does any, anybody know the great Carlos Munoz? Professor of Chicano Studies and Ethnic Studies, right? So he famously thinks about, in social movement theory, the idea that communities have been segregated. So those, those very ways in which communities are pushed into um, places and geographies that create um, a specific kind of unit of belonging, how segregation becomes congregation. And so it's really interesting that we're at this moment, perhaps, and John pushed us into this, this thinking of the idea of, of race being a positive, like identity being a place that we belong to, that we congregate round, that we create knowledge from. And in your book, Street Science, you're really trying to remind us that the ways in which we think about the issues that are circulating in our lives, the communities that are most impacted from by them already have, in some ways, the knowledge and experience to deal with them. So I'm wondering if you can talk more about geographies and exclusions and identities around racial categories also being places of congregation, a place to come from in a positive sense and not just in a negative sense. Yeah. Um. Victoria always has the most challenging questions. Um, it's nearly so, cocktail time, so just you wait. Yeah, so I can talk about the book, but I, I was going to also talk about the, the, the power and the impact of, of the film in my own uh, teaching and, 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 and research. So I really work uh, at the intersection of, of place and racism uh, and how that has shaped people's experiences, health outcomes, opportunities, uh, particularly in the United States, and the growth and the creation of places like cities and neighborhoods and suburbs are completely racialized, as many know and have already been said in this country. And I think, um, uh, so in my own work, the, the film, for example, is really important because it, 
it provides a historical context and a trajectory of a set of overlapping decisions. This didn't just happen by magic. And, uh, and uh, the role of, of you know, intentional institutions that have excluded uh, and using racism um, to, to exclude uh, by place and land and to gain wealth and, and all the other things. I thought Darlene was going to talk about eugenics because um, then I was going to have a comment about eugenics and it's you know kind of re-emergence in, uh, in the modern moment but importantly um, you know the, the, the film touches on eugenics uh, as a historic its historic moment which influences and had a strong influence in, in many sciences, including public health and our statistics we use today, and city planning as it rises to, to figure out how to um, design quote unquote healthy places and justify uh, access to suburbs. So it's an important um, anchor point, but it, of course it doesn't go away. And I think for me, that's a really important um, aspect of the film and what we're talking about here is that we haven't really learned many of the lessons. Um, that the film kind of you know, uh, exposes us to. The, another really important aspect of place and health, and I'll get to Victoria's um, uh, question, is, is the role of, of a housing policy. And again, we're seeing in the current moment the perpetuation of exclusion and displacement and intentional decisions uh, by many institutions, government, uh, financial, and others, around housing and place. And, and disruption of place. Uh, that's obviously was racialized uh, through federal housing policy and uh, Jim Crow segregation, um, and that hasn't gone away. And we haven't taken on explicitly in this country in, in any real way, I don't think, racial residential segregation, not as a historical, but a contemporary challenge that continues to shape opportunities for different folks. Um, so in terms of my own work now is, is really working in partnership uh, with communities, for example, on issues of environmental justice, that folks who are experiencing exclusion and the burdens, how that gets into our bodies, like Darlene's work, um, but how they see that in their everyday lives, have a form, I argue, and many others, is not unique to me, a form of expertise that we often ignore in science, another way that we've um, racialized and excluded who counts in the evidence that's supposed to drive our decision. So uh, my work really tries to value uh, people's local knowledge, their lived experience as actual science and part of the data that ought to be heard and brought to the fore to change uh, power relationships, to change decisions, to change inequalities uh, around exposures, around uh, decisions around who gets access to um, a housing or land or how uh, local government decisions are made. Um, I just came this morning from a team uh, that I'm working with of, of folks who are uh, returning from prison, reentry population, um, who are working in their communities as street outreach mentors to reduce violence and really uh, bring a set of healing skills to communities that have been uh, historically traumatized. So we don't recognize this as really valuable. It's seen as you know the fringes of different fields. And what I'm trying to really do in my own work and with that book and, and other things uh, and in collaboration with a lot of folks here is, is to center that um, in our fields and in our discipline and in the work, things we should be teaching here at Cal. Thanks, Jason. We'll come back to that. And then Lulu is a young scholar who was also involved in constructing the website and thinking through um, how it would demonstrate um, a new generation of thinking around the work of race. How do you take up the work of race that comes from power of the race power of an illusion and how does that influence how you think and how you organize yeah. thank you how do i take up the work um well first is unlearning everything i've learned right um and i think that hopefully not from me no 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 i'm keeping some of that <laughs> just unlearning race in the way that i've grown up thank you for sharing your personal narrative i'll i'll add I'll add to that as a racially ambiguous person that I identify with. Um, my parents are from Honduras. Uh, my dad's from the Caribbean island of Roatan, and my mom's from the mainland. Um, she identifies as Lenka indigenous, uh, Garifuna mother, so black grandmother. My father's family is both Lenka and Spanish. Now, uh, from Spain, my last name Matute coming from the port of Spain. Um, in my family, around our dinner table, 
it's a rainbow coalition, right? And likewise, our experiences are very different. Um, and my process of unlearning has also been an unlearning of race here in the US, right, on the Berkeley campus, um, and an unlearning of race when I go back to the island because I experience race, right? Uh, phenotypically, I'm read very differently on a Caribbean island, right, uh, than in a Berkeley library. Uh, also, what I'm projecting out into the world based on geography changes. Um, and, you know, I am an American born citizen. Um, I hate that I have to lead with that often, uh, but I do because there are all these privileges that are tied to that. Um, I'm also fairly, relatively light skinned, and there are so many privileges tied to that when I make it back home to to Ruatan or to Honduras. Uh, my sister, who um, you know, phenotypically is read as India, indigenous, um, is four feet 11 inches. And when we walk next to each other, um, everything changes, right? The way people read us walking into a room together, the way she interacts with me, meaning she walks behind me. You know, the, these weird little nuances that we've had to unlearn, um, first me personally having to unlearn them, uh, but then as a family having to unlearn a lot of what we internalize from um, navigating the world and navigating geography in these different spaces. Wow, that's, that's quite something. So I don't want to keep doing this kind of one, yeah. two, three, one, two, three. Do you, do you, have you heard something from each other that you would like to ask a question of the other? Yeah, um, 23 and me. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't uh, take that Groupon. Um, <laughs> Don't worry, UC Berkeley used it three years ago. Mm. Yeah. I'm glad I didn't do it, but I thought about it, right? Um, as a lot of my friends did, and kind of comparing it kind of like, oh, I'm a Taurus and a Leo, and um, yeah. these percentages, yeah. right? We all want to identify, we all want to find community, we all want to be a part of something. Um, and, you know, 23andMe, it's a great way to. Um, capitalize that need, capitalize that urge of connection. Um, but it's problematic, right? I, I, I feel the complexities of it. Like, why is it that I wanted to do that in the first place, right? What is it about my mother's indigenous blood, Lenca language, like Spanish as a second language, that I really wanted to dig into and, and name it to a certain place? Um, and my mother, who I love, uh, never went to school. Um, one of the things I'm most proud of is teaching my mother how to write her name at nine years old. Um, but she knows so, so much about the world, about cosmology, different worldview. Uh, and when we get to talking about race, you know, my mother's concept of it is very different. She says, mi mai es negra, her, my grandma, her mother. Mi pai es indio, he's indigenous. Um, he's read as indio, but we are people of the land. So it's not necessarily about are you garifuna or what the percentage of that is or phenotypically I look like this or that, um, though we have all these categories in the states as we do on the islands. Um, but my mother says it's about the land, your connection to the land, you know, your ancestors, where you grew up, where, where your parents came from, where your grandparents came from, or where you were taken from. Because slavery is a very real history uh, in the Americas, in the Caribbean. Um, and my mother talks about race or deconstructs race in her own cosmology, in her own worldview through the relationship with land. And when we talk about losing land, um, when we talk about expulsions from Honduras, when we talk about the migration of people, it's people of the <coughs> land losing their land, right? Um, and then being absorbed into the criminal injustice system, which is also benefiting, like 23andMe. Um, a piece of what I wanted to, to understand a bit more. Um, instead of going to three and 23 and me and, and digging into that, what, what do you, how do you lead someone uh, who wants to learn more about ancestry, history, connection to land and right. family? So I will come full circle to how I meant to answer the first question, which did sort of get to eugenics, which is sort of the, how I do that as a scientist. So I do it in my own work. And my research is a pain in the ass for my fellow scientists because it's so hard to study context and history and development. Those are the hardest things. And we don't have the methods to do that. We really don't have the methods. Um, in the School of Public Health, we teach. We have two courses focused on social epidemiology. One is a methods course, and one is sort of the contextualized how we're discussing 
doing today, and they're two separate courses. Like we have, we haven't figured it out as academics, um, and certainly there's no satisfying my my path. Talking about starting as a biochemistry and genetics major, and then discovering the brain. So I went all in on the brain, going, if I want to understand where plasticity is at the level of the body, then it's got to be the lived experience in this organ that's transducing this, um, which led me in all sorts of different directions. Um, but the graduate course, I, I would argue, so Thomas Kuhn, who wrote Structure of Scientific Revolutions, uh, was quite a pessimist <laughs> about change. And he wrote an, uh, an epilogue to Structure of Scientific Revolutions seven years later. And he came back to sort of being a, a little bit more optimistic and arguing that unless we are effective communicators, we can go nowhere. Uh, and again, my experience as a neurobiologist has been completely separate from my person. And it has, it's infused my work, but my pedagogy as a science student had none of this, right? So I found race, power of an illusion. After I, I, I came to Berkeley in 2005, um, I found unnatural causes, and then I found all of Larry's work, and then, and then I got to know Larry and go hang out with him. Um, and I use, I use these sort of in teaching all day, every day. Um, to, to really just reveal for specific, uh, particularly s students from STEM backgrounds in science who just, we, we don't, pedagogically, we do a terrible job. And that hasn't changed in 15 years or 20 years. Um, students who come find me for, to take you know, my graduate course, I, I'm very resolute that it's not, or absolute that it's not a methods course, that you're, this is a course about uh, ideas and history and contextualizing science and they disappear those students disappear. Yeah. So we still have biologists here, and we still have social scientists here, and kudos to the students from, again, uh, who are, uh, this is a graduate level course, who are from, they're, they're um, students who want to make, make a difference in the world, so they're learning an awful lot about gene expression, they're learning an awful lot about the, the sort of one of the first classes that we discuss is uh, Frances Galton, who's responsible, who is a eugenicist, um, and most of students had never questioned our concept of the gene, right, or where that comes from, and yet we're genotyping ourselves and we're attributing or over-attributing um, all of the things to, to this gene-centric view of the world, um, but we still live in a biological world and we live in a sociological or psychological world when uh, all of my research is demonstrating the intersection of that. Um, students from, from not science backgrounds are much more amenable to that and they're more than willing to learn the science. The STEM students don't want to have these conversations because it makes their work much more complicated, right? Study, uh, so studying environment and con context. Uh, and history and developmental history. So coming back to this notion of epigenetics and developmental programming, um, the, the uh, syllabi for my course changes based on who's in the room. And so over the last two or three years, uh, cultural trauma is a huge uh, topic of interest for students in the room. And so then we talk about gene expression and developmental programming and intergenerational transmission of biological phenotypes, not genotypes, phenotypes. Um, and so, uh, so I reveal for them, right, so that it's, the, the science is not unwieldy um, and that you're, doing, you're asking all of the right questions. But I, I have much, I'm much more optimistic about students who are coming from non-STEM backgrounds than students who are coming from STEM backgrounds. And that's my direct experience. So we're in I the Banatow Auditorium, I so I hope somebody's listening to this. But yeah, yeah. Jason, no, how does this make you think about your work? Uh, piggyback on this comment and, and say, I appreciate that, but um, we need to do better that if we're only relying on the social science type or yeah. humanities people to have this awareness that race is not genetics. Yeah. I teach a community health class of uh, 300 plus undergraduates last week or two weeks ago, whatever. You know, I asked them how many thought uh, race was genetic. About half of them raised their hand because that's what they're learning in their majors of molecular and cell biology yeah. and integrated biology Absolutely. and every other place right here in this building and, and on yeah. this campus or they're not learning it enough from Darlene and others uh, on this campus who are pushing back against that notion. So, you know, I, I don't think it's good enough that we say, let's make sure that people who understand social context and stress and racism yeah. and how that gets into our bodies, um, it, it, you know, yeah, and, I, and, and where they're coming from, and they'll take the, the, the outlier courses or get into the outlier uh, AC yeah. experiences. Uh, we, we need to center this again in these disciplines that kind of perpetuating yep. racism. I agree. I would argue, yeah, our, our pedagogy is so far 
behind. We are decades behind. Pedagogy these and research. Like, why do we continue to fund yeah. folks at the NIH or the NSF who continue to kind of be in this space? Yeah, yeah. I'm ex with I'm big ex money. Yeah. I'm exhausted yeah. with funding mechanisms where I, I have to convince my fellow neuroscientists that these things matter. And sometimes I can get two of them uh, who are then, ch and, and, but I can't ever get the third. Right, like not the appropriate funding mechanism because I have to convince them that the things that we know matter the most matter to them and it just doesn't happen. It's exhausting. 